So to my left is Liron, AKA Lyron as I know her, or for some of you know her as Leroy Jenkins. And for those of you who know who Leroy Jenkins is, good. For those of you who don't, Liron. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, hi. I'm Liron Ashkenazi Eldar, which is a total mouthful. So I go by Lirona, and I'm an art director, designer, illustrator, motion graphics artist, and a cinema for the enthusiast. I've recently uh, left a position at a creative agency called The Artery. There we did everything from motion graphics to branding and design, helping on the VFX side in, in a very three-dimensional pipeline. So everything we did was basically touching upon um, Cinema 4D in some, in some way, especially our branding work. But as I said, I just left, so I'm starting my own um, little freelance practice. I'm going to be focusing more on my own clients, also my personal work, which is more about sculpting in Cinema 4D, doing a little bit more um, products and illustration on my own as well. And then that brings me to what I'm going to be sharing with you today. As a part of my personal work, I've also developed uh, this Sketch and Tune shader that is a fine art shader. The reason why I started working on a style like that is because I was always really fascinated with fine arts, but I've never been formally educated in it. So really wanted to create something that could bridge that gap between my inability to actually draw and paint and my ability to use Cinema 4D and really create that um, really interesting intersection. And then also, because I am a motion graphics artist, I usually work in 2D, but when I do work in 3D, I wanted to create some kind of a pipeline that could move this style that looks like it's hand-drawn or hand-painted into animation. And the only way to do that instead of you know, doing a frame-by-frame frame is actually creating something that is more procedural. So today what we're going to do, um, I'm going to share that pipeline with you. And it would be really interesting to see what everyone can do with you know, a 3D scene that we start and then we can create different styles within it. So the first thing we're going to be doing is doing a very, very basic shader we're going to create this pencil sketch, and I'm going to show you how to set up the basic scene. I'm going to show you how to load in textures, how to play around with light and shadow, and that's gonna give you the very basic of how to, how to start. Then we're gonna be moving into a little bit more of a complex scene. We're gonna use a different style. We're gonna do a watercolor scene, and again, we're starting with a very basic 3D scene, and we can take it anywhere we want with that shader. So we're going to be introduced to the color system in uh, the hatch. We're going to add uh, a light stroke, which is going to add us a third color. Then we're going to play around with Cinema 4D layers in order to create more complexity in the shader so we don't get just stuck with three colors. We can move and create more complexity. And then we can play around with multiple lights in the scene because we're not just stuck to one light and one shadow. We can actually create uh, as complex of a scene as we want with the shader and everything corresponds. The, fourth, uh, the third scene is I'm going to show you a couple of tricks to go within Cinema 4D to create these post effects. So we're going to use sketch and tune strokes to create these overshoot, underlined sketch tunes. And then we're going to play around with ambient inclusion to create these really nice uh, shadows that um, are not necessarily coming from our light, but actually are just contact shadows to add, again, a little bit more complexity to the shader. And then the fourth part is going to be all about animation. So we're going to start with a very basic scene. I'm going to show you what it's made of. And then we're going to render and see what the problems of using this uh, Sketch and Tune shader uh, arise from that. And then I'm going to show you a very, very quick way to solve this. OK, so let's start. Let's go to cinema. So what we're going to start doing is building the very basic scene. We're going to start with a disk from our, our objects here. We're going to create this floor. I'm going to go into my rotation segments and add a little bit to create uh, a smoother sphere. Then we're going to add a little uh, la 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 sphere. We're going to bring that up a bit using the move tool. Again, smooth it out a bit with segments. That's great. Now what we're going to do is add a camera so we can, um, we can go ahead and position our view of where we want the scene to be. That's nice. And now we're going to add a light. That's the first thing we're going to do. 
So the light starts really low, and we can like pull it out. And in this view, we can actually position approximately when, where we want our light direction to be, and then in a second, where our shadows would be as well. So if I go into my light, and then I go down into shadows, I can turn on shadows, and I'm going to turn on shadow map soft. And the way that I could actually look at where my shadows are in this scene instead of just rendering, right? I can go into option and turn on shadows. And that would give me a little bit of a preview of where my shadows are when I'm working in here. And I'm going to turn it off because it's a little bit heavy on the computer. So it doesn't really help when it's on. But now I know where my shadows are. That's fantastic. OK, so we're going to start by starting the shader. Double clicking in this window or going into create new material will start us a material. And what we want to be doing is we want to turn off color and reflectance. And the reason why we want to do that is I don't want my shading and shadow to be actually interacting in a normal way in Cinema 4D. So I'm going to be only tagging on luminance. So I'm going to have this white luminance object. And I'm going to add it to my disk and to my sphere. And now I'm also going to be adding a background over here and leave it be. So let's turn on our interactive render region in order to see what we're doing the entire time. I'll skate it up a bit. And then using this little toggle here, I'm going to make it high res because the lower it is, the less resolution it is. And the more I push it up, it's going to give me these smooth, nice edges. So now we're going to start building the shader. Going into our matte luminance, we're going to add uh, texture. And instead of just a regular texture, we're going to go all the way down to Sketch and Tune and add the hatch. So the hatch shader is actually built for you to be able to cross hatch strokes. But instead of doing that, what we're going to do is using textures, so full on large textures. When I started working out in this, um, in this shader, I started with one stroke and saw how it looked, and then slowly made my texture larger, and then realized that the larger my textures are, the more I can slap them onto each other and create complexity with them. So it's not just a cross hatch. It's actually now becoming to be a texture. So now I'm going to go into and load a texture over here, go into my text. And now I have a few that I've made, but we're going to go with this crayon pencil sketch. So we're going to open that up. I'm going to say no to move it around. And you can start seeing that we have it tiled in a very bizarre way. What I want to be doing in this window right now is I want to make sure the entire uh, object is covered. All of the objects are covered. And I'm going to do that by using all of these parameters. So I want to stress that this little window here is really the soul of the shader. And you want to be playing as much as possible with the variations of it. I'm going to go and show you how to cover it pretty fast. But in general, the more you play with it, if you change the scale, the texture would scale. If you offset it, the texture would offset. And so in order to create a lot of different variations in the um, shader, you want to play around with that. But for now, I'm going to turn on Tile UV so it would tile the texture on top of one another, which is what I want, because I want to cover it. And then I'm going to turn on rotational UVs as well in order to create another way to rotate the texture on top of each other and also tile it in the rotation. Then I'm going to add a little bit of a rotation here, probably 50. Nice. And what I want to be doing now is eliminate the gaps that we're getting here. As you can see, we're pretty close with you know, covering the entire thing up. But I want to make sure that I don't have these weird wide gaps. So I'm going to go into Spacing U and Spacing V and bring it down into the minuses, move it onto one another, approximately 20 here. And then let's do a little bit more. Opa. So this is starting to look cool. Everything is covered. I get this really nice variation in the texture. That's exactly what I want. So you must be thinking, OK, this looks weird. What's happening? Where's the light? So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into the Elimination tab. And this is where all the magic begins. Basically, we're going to be turning on 
lights, which is going to create this interaction of the shader with lights. And we're going to turn on shadow, which will create uh, an interaction of shadows in the scene. So as you can see, we don't have um, color turned on in here. If we did, it would actually mess up the entire thing and makes it look unrealistic. We really want to be sticking into luminance at that point. Now. I'm having two problems here. First of all, I, wanna, I have a background, and I want this background to be the same color of our floor. So I'm going to open a new material, put it on my background, and have it, again, in luminance channel, just completely white. So two things that are happening in the shader that isn't really believable. One, we have this really, really harsh light in here that doesn't create a really nice gradient between our shadows and our color. And the second thing is that we have a floor, which we need in order to have shadows, but we're getting this really rough line over here with shadowing, and it doesn't really look that great. So we're going to tackle both of those things. The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to tackle the first problem, which is this harshness of white. We're going to go into the Elimination tab again, and now what we're going to be playing with is these colors here. So right now, my white is completely white. Basically, it's going from black to white. What I wanted to be doing is not do that. And I'm going to go with a very low number just to show you how low you can go. It's not going to be the look that we're looking for. But if I go 50, it's going to be really gray. And now we can start seeing how it's still interacting with light, but it's not really revealing the lightness that we want. So I'm going to go in at about 80. And now we start getting this really nice uh, movement between darks and lights. And our shadow is a little bit too dark, maybe. So I can play around with this color over here and drop it down a bit. And that would create a little bit of a less harsh shadow here. And that's nice. And now the second thing that we were talking about is actually solving this weird problem over here. So I'm going to get snap out of my interactive render region and turn off my camera. And I'm going to be looking at my scene from above. Let's see it. And now I'm going to be turning on the interactive region again. So right now, as we can see, everything is working in the scene, but this part is really dark. So what we're going to be doing is actually tackling this problem the same way that we tackle the first uh, where the light is. So we're just going to add another light. And now instead of turning on shadows, we're just going to keep it as is. We're going to grab this light, and we're going to be moving it all the way to where the floor kind of ends. And we're going to be eliminating and eliminating and illuminating this part of the floor, basically making it white and basically creating this seamless transfer into the background. And now if we move back into our camera, we start getting the scene that we want. And obviously, we can move the light up a little bit more, and that would create less of here. If we play around with the darkness of our gray color here, it will create a cleaner scene Otherwise, um, this feels really good. So this is really the beginning. Oops. This is really the beginning of our shader here, and uh, we're going to be moving into a little bit more of a complex scene and start dealing with um, another texture and also some colors. Okay. So we have here a pretty simple scene, uh, yet a little bit more complex. And we have a torus, a plant, base, column, floor, our camera. Uh, we have our light that's, that has shadow. And we have a background. Now, if you render it out, we're not really getting anything. It's fantastic. So double clicking to create a new material, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to apply this material on everything right now. And again, when you create your pieces, you'd probably want to create a different material for each object. But for the sake of timing, we're just going to create one unanimous type of um, look, as well as my background. Now again, going into color, reflectance, turn on luminance, and going in all the way down to sketch and tune, hatch. Fantastic. And now what we're going to do, instead of taking a very, very grainy kind of pencil sketch texture, I'm going to go and pick out a watercolor texture. So 
what I want to be doing is taking a texture that has a lot of details in it, and that for me is the best one that we can take right now. It has some graininess in it. It will overlap real nice, and that's kind of where I want to be. So I'm going to turn on the interactive render region again, and all of a sudden, we have this really bizarre problem, uh, which is easily fixable. If we're just going to go into our plant and then into our projection map, instead of UV mapping, some materials will just you know, act like that on, on different models. So we're going to go into UV mapping. And I'm going to go with either cubic or spatial. Uh, cubic works right now, so I'm going to keep it as that. Now, as you can see, our texture is a little bit too small. So we want to go in and start playing around with this little baby. So I'm going to tile UV because I want everything to be overlapping on top of another. And then I'm going to scale it up for about 200%. And now I'm going to add crosses, which is going to multiply the texture onto itself. Uh, and that's already covering a lot of the work here. And as we can see, we're still getting a lot of information, lots of textures, and that's what we want. So again, going into spacing U and spacing V, um, going to bring that down until everything is covered. Uh, usually, numbers are interchangeable here. And also, it would, every time you click on it, it definitely changes the scene a lot. So again, play around in that mode. It's really interesting. Once you start scattering, once you start creating variation, we can also create variation in, I don't know, the size of the texture. And that's going to create something completely different. So what we really want to be doing is playing a lot in this place. But for now, I'm just going to cover all of that a little bit more. And OK, then. We have it covered. That's fantastic. I'm going to go into my background. And instead of using mapping, uh, let's just have that over here. Yeah. I want to make sure that this is in a frontal position in order to get all the details here. But as you can see, we have a very grimy and grungy scene, which doesn't look that great. So we're going to go, because it doesn't really work with that texture. <laughs> we're going to go into a new tab that we haven't talked about, which is color. And now what we have here is background color, which is going to be our base color for a model, light stroke color, which is going to be our highlight, and dark stroke color. And let's start coloring it up a little bit. So I'm going to go with, because we're dealing with this watercolor scene, like let's go with not a black shadow. We can go with a brighter blue. That would be fun. OK, that's good. Then for our background color, let's go with something contrasty, orange, and nice. And now for a light color, maybe instead of white, more of uh, this minty color. Oh, but we don't see it. The reason why we're not seeing it is because in the illumination tab, there's a little bit of a check here, checkbox that's called show light strokes. And what we're going to do is turn that on, and we immediately Huh. Oh, sorry. We will see it the second that we turn on lights and shadows. And now our scene is receiving both lights and shadows. And we can play around with this color. Maybe we want it to be a little bit blue. And that's already looking kind of dope. Now, as I told you, we're in a really nice place. But do we only want to stay with those three particular colors? Maybe. but. The next thing that we can do is we can create layers and start layering this on top of one another. So the way to do that is to go into our um, luminance tab here. And instead of going and adding another um, hatch, we're going to create a layer. So that would take my hatch and put it in a layer. I'm going to do the same thing that I did. But right now, I'm just going to copy this shader. And that's right click, copy shader. And then go into shader. And then I'm going to click paste, sh paste shader. Now, I'll put it at about, let's say, 50% in soft light. And what we're going to be getting is a lot more of a contrasty scene. That's because we haven't really changed anything. But what we want to be doing is going inside the hatch again, and then now maybe playing a little bit with colors again, maybe making our base color you know, purple so we start getting a movement here. And then what we want to be doing is actually scattering around or offset our texture. So instead of being the same exact texture, we can go and move it around. 
And now we're getting more complexity, more colors, and we can do it as many times as we possibly want. We can use more rotation, so that would like rotate the texture on top completely. And that starts to show you how deep we can go. And obviously, we don't have to stay around in soft light. We can do multiply. We can overlay, depending on the contrast that you want. I found that soft light with some opacity over here really works well with layering stuff out. So that's basically it. We're going to add another light right now, because I just want to show you how quickly the scene would change. Uh, the moment that we have another light and another shadow. So I snapped out of my camera so I can look around. And let's move that over here, for example. And as you can see, immediately, by just adding more shadows into the scene and creating more interactions in the shader, we're going to create um, a different kind of look. And that does a lot. So you can add more shadows to create more interactions in the scene, and we can make that as complex as we want. But for now, I'm feeling pretty good about this. So I think we should be moving into our post effect. And our post effect is going to be done on a different scene, just because I wanted to show you variations. So this is a scene that I created as a part of my personal work. And it's an illustration that's kind of like crayony or like colored pencils, I guess. And what I'm using is another kind of texture here. And I'm going to show you that texture, because it's really interesting. I'm going to locate the image. So this texture actually has a ton of details. It's very light, but it's really good to um, stack on top of one another. So the lighter texture you get and the more you stack, the more uh, variation in the texture you'll get. So I really like that it has these light strokes and then really dark strokes as well. And then also, it's very grainy. So that's basically why we're getting this kind of grainy, sketchy looking thing. And now, two ways to upgrade the scene a little bit. One would be to add ambient occlusion. And I'm just not adding regular ambient occlusion, because that, for me, is a big tell uh, in Cinema 4D. So the second I look at something and I see ambient occlusion, I feel like I know exactly where it's been done and why. So for me, that's a big tell. So what I want to be doing is actually downgrading the ambient occlusion a ton to make it grainy, to make it look nothing like ambient occlusion, but still getting these really nice contact shadows. And also, right now, we're getting contact shadows, but not enough. So first, I'm going to go into accuracy and lower that down, way down, because it's going to help my computer think, and that's what we want. And we don't really need this to be high res, so it's fine. Now, minimum and maximum samples, the higher we'll go here, the better um, and less grainy our contact shadow would be. But I want to go into 5 and 5, which would make it super grainy. You'll see that in a second. And then in my, as you can see, really, really grainy. This is kind of what I want. Now, in my dispersion, I don't want it to go everywhere in such a dispersed way. I actually want to bring it down to about, I don't know, 70. And now we start getting the contact shadow that I want that feels more stylized, that feel less cinema, that's adding a little bit more content to my scene. The next thing I want to do is I don't want these dark shadows. My entire scene is based on these really nice um, red kind of uh, warm shadows. And that's exactly what I want to be doing. I want to go and put a nice pink, light pink over here and see what that gives us. Yeah, so now I'm adding a little bit more of the vibe of the scene back into my scene. I can go a little bit darker and a little bit less saturated if I want to create more of this contact shadow over here, which is exactly what I want to be doing. And then I can go ahead and play around with the contrast. If I want it to be less contrasty, because I am seeing quite a lot of it, I can go into minus 20 maybe, and that will chill it out a little bit more. But as you would see, when I turn it off and on, it creates another layer that I wouldn't be able to do without ambient occlusion here. So I think it's, it adds a lot to the complexity of the scene. Now, the second thing we're going to add is Sketch and Tune. And what this is going to do is ruining our scene immediately. 
So I'm going to go into shading, and I'm going to turn off color, and I'm going to turn off shading on the object, because I don't want my shader to be uh, affected at all by it. All I want to do is create some strokes. So I'm going to turn off shadows here. Background should be changing at all. And now what I'm getting is strokes on top of my original drawing, which is fantastic. Now if I go into my main line, I'm going to open this little triangle, which is basically just connecting to this um, sketch material that I have here, but I like to control it over in this window. So the first thing I want to do is these lines are way too perfect. I want to make sure that I fuck it up a little bit so it looks you know, more realistic. The way that I do that, uh, okay, yeah. Um, I'm going to go to adjust. And I'm going to start by overshooting the lines, and I'm going to 3D transform this line. So I'm going to go into overshoot, and I'm going to click relative. So we would take the length of the line and overshoot it. And I'll add about 20 degrees in both ends. Let's see how that looks. OK, interesting. Now I'm going to be adding a little bit of variation so we don't have this unanimous movement. And I'm going to go pretty high with that. Nice. Now it still feels a bit too much. Let's downgrade this into 10. OK, we're getting there. Now what we want to be doing is we want to make sure our lines that we drew before we painted this piece was not you know, perfectly aligning to where we drew, because we're not you know, trying to draw that way. <laughs> so I'm going to turn on uh, Transform. And what I'm going to do is just rotate it a little bit. Basically, just make it a little bit imperfect. So I'm going to move it once, maybe twice, and then, and then another movement in our P here. Again, everything that we can do to make it a little bit imperfect. I can uh, you know, scale it up a bit to bring it into position. Come on. And that would fuck up my overshoot, apparently. So let's keep that as zero. But then maybe add another rotation here. Nice. So right now we're getting these lines that aren't perfect, that aren't really matching, which is exactly what we want to be doing. It played around with um, our overshoot as well. So we're not getting these lines going everywhere because of that playing around with the 3D transform. And now what we want to be doing is really uh, you know, make this a little bit less intense, because that's not how it would look. So the first thing we want to do, and very easily, if we'll go into thickness and we just turn on join angle, it's going to create an angle in our um, stroke. So already, by just clicking join angle, we're already getting a little bit more of a realistic sketch line. That's one. And then if we're going to opacity, we want to do the same thing, because if we drew a line pretty hard, then we'll be getting the same kind of opacity change in the line as much as a thickness change. So again, going to join angle. And on top of that, I'll add noise as well. So it'll make it even more random. And now after that, we have this. We can go ahead and you know change a little bit about like how much strength it is. Are we seeing enough of it? It's a taste thing. Like I like to keep it there, but just really minimalist. Um, but if you want, like you can play around with how much of this join angle strength we have. If you go over down here, and that would bring back a little bit of that opacity um, back, and it would be a little bit stronger. But I like to keep it as that. Now, another way to think about it is that we do have these uh, strokes that were drawn before uh, our design was made. But we can also do something that's more stylized. And I like to play around with the color of the stroke. So if we go, we have this like nice red scene, warm scene. If we go and we add warmer strokes that are light, that would also give us a completely different kind of look that's more stylized. And again, it's, it's a decision. And there's so much to play around with all of these. But for me, just those three steps already bring it into a completely place than it was when we started, which is a little bit more flat, a little bit less details. Once this is going to work, uh, you're going to see it. OK, yeah. So we can start with a very clean scene. We can stay on it. But I really like to add those little notes of I was there before sketching it with a pencil uh, kind of world. So this is the end of our three, third part. 
And what we're going to be doing now is we're going to go into our animation stage. So what I have here is just a rotating rock. I built that rock. And then I added a really nice bevel to it because details with the shader is really important. So I'm going to go into an interactive render region now. And you can see our scene here. What we have is three different um, textures. We have the stone that's using the same texture that we used before that I just showed you, which is this one. Again, uh, this is a very different look. And it's all done by just using different colors. And like what color our light stroke is changes a lot about the design. So if we go inside, you'll be able to see that I have this really light light stroke and a very bright orange. And then my shadow is really contrasty blue. And that gives it that look. Now, on the floor, I actually combine two different uh, sketch and tunes to create this more uh, pastel look. And again, just having two uh, different hatches, one in hard light, the other one is normal, tracking onto each other, changing the colors a bit, uh, creates that texture here that uh, has a lot more color in the shading. So basically, if I go in and I turn that off, what I'm going to get is a very similar shadow, but we're going to have a lot less detail in it. So by turning it on, I'm just creating another layer of complexity into my shadow here. So if we had all the time in the world, I'll render it out for you right now. But because we don't, I'm going to show you what I've pre-rendered so we can examine our work here. Uh, where is that? OK. So I'm going to bring it into After Effects, and we're going to be looking at this. So as you can see, the texture is you know, reacting to light. Everything is happening the way that I wanted. But it's not really believable. Because if we were to do this frame by frame in Photoshop, the texture would never have looked like that. It would never have just tiled and not move at all. And that's, for me, is a big tell. So even though it, it looks good when we're in still mode, the second we render it out, it gets uh, unbelievable and just, you know, I want to be fixing that right now. So the way that I figure out how to do that is using um, animated GIFs instead of a regular texture. So I'm going to show you uh, an animated GIF that I created. And then I'm going to show you very quickly how to create an animated GIF from a very, very simple one texture. So I created an animated GIF from this texture. And this is our result. And I'm going to show you exactly how I did that in three seconds. If I go into After Effects again, I'm going to take this texture in. And I'm going to bring it into a new composition. Um, nothing's happening right now. So I'm going to go two frames ahead using Command and the Move tool and cut this, cut this layer out using um, Option and Bracket. And then I'm going to use Command D to duplicate it and create four different textures. And this is basically going to be our texture. So now I'm clicking N to close my render region here. I'm going to go and trim my comp area. And this is our texture. Now, you can do that if you draw in Photoshop. You can draw different textures and then create a GIF from it. It'll be the same. But if you have one texture that you found online and it's really nice and you want to be using that, uh, I just wanted to show you what a really, whoops, what a really quick way, um, sorry. Oh, OK. What a really quick way to create a GIF is. So the first uh, frame is going to stay the same. The second one, we're going to open up Scale. And we're going to click S. And now we're going to toggle this little uh, key like chain off. And going to first uh, my X and clicking minus. So that's going to be flipping my texture once. Then I'm going to go to the third one, do the same thing, click S going, unchaining it, and then put minus in our Y. And that's going to be flipping it the other way. And now I'm going to go into my fourth one, click S, 
And oops, no, I don't need to unchain that. And now I want both of them to be minus, and now it's going to be flipping it both ways. So what I'm getting here is actually an animated texture made out of one texture. So now we will open up Cinema again. And we need to go into each and every one of these and change the texture. We're going to start with the stone. So opening up our layer, going inside, instead of the light sketch JPEG, I'm going to be loading my animated GIF that I exported. So the way to export it is either export it into Photoshop, save it from there, or use an amazing um, plugin called GIFGON that's a lifesaver that I think everyone should use always. So it's really easy to render out from After Effects. So now I brought that in. Super simple. All I need to do is click on my texture, going to my animation tab here, and make sure that my mode is in loop or ping pong, but particularly loop. Now my animation, my, my GIF will be rendering out looping. So now I'll go in here into my shader, and I'm just going to copy this entire entire texture so when I go into the next shaders I can just paste it and it's going to still have the loop turned on in there. Okay. And now imagine that we're rendering this out again. You won't be seeing anything rendering from here but now when we render it out again Now we're starting to get a much more believable, moving image of a uh, sketch and tune that's mimicking a stop motion animation. But it's not the end here. So if we were to create a stop motion animation, we would never use 30 frames per second. This is why this is looking so smooth and weird and you know, uncannily graphic. So what we want to be doing is going into effects and presets and going into posterize time, which I love. And now instead of 24 frames per second, I'm going to go all the way down to 8. And I realized that the combination between 8 in the frame rate and using two, in, 2 frames in creating a GIF is actually a really nice balance. I tried a lot, and for that, it was sitting the best way possible. And now when we render this out, we are starting to get a more believable you know, stop motion animation that uh, we can play around with it. We can use, you know, a longer GIF would give you a little bit more uh, variation. But that's just the beginning. And as I said, I really do think that people should play around a lot in this window and see what they can do with a lot of different textures and a lot of different GIFs. So that was me. I'll go back to my presentation. How am I on time? Nice. So this is me. And please contact me with any questions. I really want everyone to try this and see what you guys come up with, because um, it's kind of just the beginning of the path for me. And, and I would love to see what more could be done with it. I'm going to continue exploring this shader. But uh, please email me with results if anyone's doing it. Thank you.